Okay, so this is number 12 of we original Warren and I originally planned 12 and today it's been a year So we've reached that goal that feels good and like I mentioned We're gonna do a couple of more up here a couple that have been requested that we haven't got to you know We'll do Morphe in April and then the plan is to do or Lasker probably in May and Capablanca in June or maybe vice versa maybe try to stay chronological there but anyway so as always I'm going to take care of the historical side and Warren will take care of the chess analysis I've got three really good games for you um, concerning Judith Polgar who is historically speaking the best woman's or best female player to ever play the game and there's some debate about whether that will that record will last forever and ever. We'll get into that. But for the moment, she is by far the strongest female player to play. So Judith Polgar was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1976. And she is one of three sisters that most people have heard of. The oldest child is named so um, Susan. Susan was born in 1969. And there's quite an age gap between Susan and Judith. And then the middle sister is named Sophia. And I have there their names as they were originally written in um, Hungarian. Now, I, um, they, they do go by Susan and Sophia and Judith now, and Judith is also, I've seen her referred to as Judy. I think family friends and old friends may call her Judy. So Judy was a lot, uh, Judith was a lot closer in age to Sophia, and Susan was kind of the first child and was kind of the, well, I guess for lack of a better word, I would say guinea pig. Now let me explain what I mean by guinea pig. In a way, all three girls were guinea pigs because Laszlo Polgar, um, the father, is an educational psychologist and he wrote a book called Bring Up Genius. And I have the book cover here, but that's a reissue from like the late 80s. The first book actually came out in the 60s before Susan was even born. So he wrote this book called Bring Up Genius in which he put forth the opinion that genius is trained, not born. And so he set about to test this theory. And he actually met his wife, Clara, who was a, uh, a language teacher for the express purpose of having children and, and testing his theories on them. So it wasn't your normal, you know, they, they exchanged letters, uh, Laszlo and Clara, and it wasn't your normal letter swapping where I miss you so much and I love you and this, that, and the other. It was more like, and then when they're three, we're going to introduce them to math, and then when they're four, we're going to introduce them to, you know, Esperanto. And I thought that we could spend five hours a day doing this and, you know, two hours a day doing that. So it was actually essentially planning out curriculum. And Clara got on board to try it, and uh, they had their first child, Susan. And they started working with Susan at a very early age. And they didn't especially know that they were going to start with chess. What happened was Susan opened a drawer and found a chess set and took it out and started playing with it. She's five years old. So Laszlo said, and, and, and you know, Clara reports to Laszlo that she wants to learn how to play. And so Laszlo says, well, I'll teach her the rules and maybe this is it, maybe it's chess. Chess, after all, has no element of luck. The better prepared player typically wins. And chess has been a male-dominated sport. There's been all this talk about, you know, genius versus, you know, effort, uh, nature versus nurture, if you will. Well, let's test it. Let's teach our daughter chess. Now, that wasn't the only thing that Susan studied. By the age of five, Susan could speak Esperanto, Russian, German, in addition to her native uh, Hungarian. By six, she was beating most of the chess players in Budapest, and she was also learning essentially university-level mathematics. Now, this to us seems perhaps a little bit crazy, but the way that they were able to accomplish this is by A, homeschooling their children, and B, having Clara and Laszlo to a certain extent devote most of their waking hours to the girls. And so Susan was able to um, learn a, an immense amount of, of information and knowledge and progress extremely quickly by any measure and stretch of the imagination. And what happened was originally, while, while Susan was training, Sophia and Judith would look into the room kind of in awe and so the father capitalized on that by inviting him into the room but saying okay you can come in you can listen but you know you can't interrupt so they started the girls 
Sophia and Judith started actually a little bit earlier than Susan did. And in a very short time, they were both able to solve some of the problems that were presented to Susan, and they were able to beat family friends in chess, and they both progressed very quickly from there. Now, ironically, Judith, well, Susan, excuse me, said that of all the sisters, Sophia probably had the most talent, that Judith, the youngest daughter, was actually, and the strongest player historically, was actually the late, uh, she was a slow learner at first. So they say Sophia had the most potential, but Sophia had the less, the least amount of, I suppose, will to pursue chess, and so she only became an international master, as opposed to, you know, a grandmaster. I say that sarcastically. Now, they were, they were homeschooled, and in Hungary this caused a problem, because Hungary at the time was a socialist government. They believed in treating all the citizens equally, and the idea of homeschooling your children was somewhat, somewhat anathema to that regime. And so um, Laszlo had a lot of back and forth issues with the Hungarian authorities, to the extent that one day a uniformed police officer showed up and physically took Susan to school. Now that didn't, uh, it didn't stay that way. Susan and, and the sisters continued to be homeschooled and they were for, for most of their life. And according to Judith, this consisted of about five to six hours of chess per day. It consisted of language instruction, mathematics, but there really wasn't time to go out and play with friends or socialize. They, you know, they didn't swim in a local club or, or anything like that. Their only physical outlet that I could find was table tennis and apparently they got wicked good at that too. And so, and you may wonder as I did, how did Clara feel about all this? Because Laszlo said, well, here's what we're gonna do. But Clara was actually left with the day-to-day -day stuff of implementing this curriculum and doing all the normal house stuff, cleaning, cooking, etc. And as you can see from a picture in the top right, they're still married to this day. And so they stuck together, you know, for almost 40 years now, which is impressive in itself. Sorry, 50 years now, yikes. But Clara said something very interesting. She said, quote, I am always part of the realization. The thread follows the needle. I am the thread. And so she, she accepted and still accepts to this day kind of her role in the grand scheme of things. Now, she said everything that Laszlo has promised, and I'm paraphrasing here, has come true. So she really believes in what they did. And the girls seem well enough adjusted. They don't seem like, you know, they seem uh, sociable, they seem well adapted, they seem um, emotionally balanced. So in many, many different ways, we could say that this experiment was a success in validating Laszlo Pogar's claims that chess is trained instead of, um, instead of just naturally inherent. Now, I was reminded in doing research for this of a book that I read, and I actually brought it with me, um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Has anyone read this book? So Malcolm Gladwell is a journalist, um, and Outliers was a New York Times bestseller. He also wrote Tipping Point, Blink, and a, a couple of other books that, that have gotten quite a bit of acclaim. And in Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell proposes the 10,000 hour principle. The idea is that if you spend 10,000 hours on something, you're gonna be very good at it. It's not really a matter of natural ability. It's the amount of time you spend on something. And so what Gladwell proposes is that the best violinists in the world are the ones who have spent at least 10,000 hours playing violin and practicing, the best pianists, the same thing, the best chess players, the same thing. And if you look at chess as a whole and all the people we've covered in all these lectures, most of them had a devilishly strong work ethic from Bobby Fischer to Kasparov to Karpov even. The one exception that I can think of, or a couple of exceptions I can think of, are people like Sammy Ryshevsky, who at age seven was just a prodigy, um, or maybe Capablanca, and we're getting into Capablanca in a few months, but reportedly Capablanca didn't even have a chess set at home and, uh, and still would go to tournaments and dominate. So there are perhaps a couple of exceptions, and you know, we could look at other domains and talk about Mozart you know, performing for royalty in Europe in, at the age of five and six and composing his first symphony at a really early age. And so we could find some exceptions there, but the rule seems to be that chess requires an investment of copious amounts of time. And the Pogars really bear that out, and I think it's pretty interesting to consider 
that uh, Laszlo had this idea and validated his idea. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about another experiment that he almost tried, but he was talked out of. So the girls spent a lot of time playing chess. If you looked at their apartment, they lived in a very modest apartment in Budapest. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have a lot of um, uh, material goods or wealth. They had to adapt their rooms to accommodate what they were doing. And in one wall of one of the main rooms of the apartment, they had a full wall with a file cabinet. Now, if you look at that, it looks like an old school library card catalog. And that's pretty much exactly what it was. And on all of the index cards were games that had been played. So you're talking tens of thousands of games. They were, there were positions that could serve as puzzles. There was also scouting on potential opponents. And so their previous matches, you know, how they played, how their games worked. So they were extremely organized. So we, we can't overlook that, right? Now, also in this picture, you'll notice that Judith and Sophia are playing blindfold or blindfold blitz. And they're both reaching behind them to hit the clock. And Laszlo's making the moves on the board. They didn't need the board. Both girl, all the girls were very capable blitz players and very capable blindfold players. At the age of eight, Judith could beat five people blindfold simultaneously, you know, with no issues. And, and for them, blindfold blitz was fun. That was their, like, take a load off from studying these, these games sort of activity. That was their fun little break. They also, you'll be happy to know, devoted 20 minutes a day to joke telling. Yeah, exactly 20. So they were, they were regimented, and, and I don't want you to think the opposite, but you know, they spent a lot of time studying chess, four to six hours a day, and math and languages. I couldn't find any mention of studying things like art. Couldn't really find much about you know them studying history. I'm sure there are some, but that act, that certainly took a back seat to languages. First of all, remember Clara was a language teacher, and to chess. Now all the girls showed talent. I don't want to uh, minimize how good Susan was and is. Uh, because for the longest time, Susan was the number two woman in the world, with only Judith being a number higher. Sophia reached international master status. You know, she had a very famous outing in, I think, 1989 called the Sack of Rome, where she went to Italy and just destroyed a bunch of um, uh, IMs and GMs there. So I don't want to denigrate their accomplishments, but from about the age of about eight onward, Judith was, was the talent, and the, the sisters knew it, and everybody who watched them play knew it. So here are a couple of interesting photos. First, you have you know, Susan being uh, essentially their teacher and kind of their role model. Susan, incidentally, was the first woman to achieve the Grand Master title the normal way. That is, she achieved three GM norms, 2,500 ELO, and all the other requisites for Grand Master and Judith was the second. There were a couple of women who had had Grandmaster titles previously, but it's because they won the Women's World Championship and they automatically get accorded the International Grandmaster title by winning that tournament. So here you have Judith playing blindfold against Florencio Campomanes. And this, art, this picture actually comes from Frederick Friedel, who is the founder of Chess Base, and we've talked about him like in the Kasparov lecture. The, the cover of the magazine also comes from Friedel. And you see actually Sophia playing the chess computer and Judith watching. And uh, th there's a funny story where Fred Friedel comes up to the programmer who designed one of these chess programs and says, so the girls beat the program. And, uh, and, and the, woman, uh, the woman who programmed it said, well, of course they didn't. They destroyed it. They dismantled it. They picked it apart. And she was very pleased by this. And so these girls from, a, from an early age were, were very impressive. And you see Laszlo in both pictures, by the way. He's, he's prominently in the, in the background, um, almost always with the girls. He and Clara and all the family really traveled together for most of their activities. They spent that time together. You'll be happy to know Florencio Campomanes was a pretty accomplished blitz player. You remember, remember he participated for the Philippines on their Olympiad team in the 50s. And he had a reputation as pretty good. And uh, Friedel basically alluded to the fact that he, he uh, that Judith just, just dismantled him in a couple of games of blitz. For those of us who really see Campo Manas as the villain of the Kasparov-Karpov um, fiasco in 1984, we can take some gratification in knowing that he was beaten by a little girl. And that said, there were, there were a lot of people who were at this time. I mean, this, this, this was not an isolated incident. 
by a very early age, the girls were beating pretty much everyone in, in Budapest and in Hungary. And that caused some various issues that we're going to get into soon. But before, before we do that, let me take you to our first game, which is actually uh, played in 1987. Remember, Judith at this time is about a, either 11 or 12 years old. I think she's 11 years old at this time. And she's playing her first, well, I don't think she's playing her first grandmaster, but she's, I'll spoil it for you, beating her first grandmaster. Um, and this, this is quite a feat. And for that, I'll turn it over to Warren for analysis. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, Judith really was, uh, she, she got good really fast. You know, if you remember from the Kasparov lecture, uh, Kasparov, he didn't beat a GM until he was about 15 years old. So Polger bested that by about four years. You know, she, she really, uh, she's, she's definitely what you would call a prodigy. I mean, probably the only person who might have been better at a young age might be like Ryshevsky. But other than that, I mean, it's it's hard to think of, of players that were at her level so young. Um, one of the interesting things I think about this game is how mature her play was. I mean, it was a very sharp game, but the way she handled the, the swings, I, I think is pretty impressive for an 11-year-old. Uh, one of the one of the more interesting things she says, too, is the, the psychological... You know, boost she got from, from beating her first GM. Just the rush and confidence. You know, a part of it is when, when you beat a grandmaster, that's the highest title they award in chess, right? So, in terms of title, I mean, there are players you can be the world champion, but you, know, you, you just you just beat one of the best of the best. You know, that that'd be like uh, you know fighting a Shaolin monk or something and winning, right? I mean, that's it, that's kind of the equivalent. And you know, speaking from experience, I, I didn't beat my first GM until I was 19. And I, when I, that happened, I was just, I was on cloud nine. It's something like that. That feels good, okay? But I feel pretty old, you know, <laughs> lagging eight years behind her, you know? But, uh, yeah, let's just get started. She made a lot of contributions to the Sicilian defense, by the way. She knew how to handle this opening. Uh, she, she would always, almost always play the open Sicilian, of course, for white. It's the critical line. Oh, she mentions in her book, actually, uh, and you can tell from her games, but later on in her career, she she preferred to play the this, this G4 move, you know, which initiates the Karras attack, which is really more in keeping with her style. She loves these very complex, sharp positions. You know, she's she's kind of like a, a female version of Shiroff, I feel like, or you could say Shiroff was a male version of Polgar. You know, <laughs> you can really go either way. <laughs> But at the time, she says she was influenced by Karpov. You know, she saw the karpov Kasparov match, and uh, she saw his success, you know, at least in the opening, not in, not, in, not in the game in the end. But she saw his success with this move, so that's why she chose it. So first point here, uh, Black's move order by playing Queen C7 here. This, this move controls this E5 square. So if white were to play slowly, like, you know, say, king h1, then black can play b5, okay? As opposed to playing knight c6 first. You know, if black plays knight c6 first, there's no option for playing b5 anymore, obviously, right? So this is kind of a, a precise move where Polgar called it tricky. You know, I call it precise, right? So a4 is the reason behind that. Now here's here's where black starts to go wrong. Uh, you know, queen e1 isn't the most popular move, and kind of with good reason because black can either take on b4 or just play bishop d7 or or even play e5. Now all, all of these are pretty effective. Uh, one of the reasons is that this king on g1, uh, in some cases, handles black to trade pieces. You know, like for example, say knight takes d4 here, takes. In this resulting position, black can trade more pieces after bishop c5. And white doesn't want that here. The closer you get to an endgame, the worse, because we have this ice on e4. Right? But instead, black kind of speculated with this move. Now is where uh, things kind of get interesting. 
I mean, white white has a couple of good possibilities. I mean, you could play king h1. She could play maybe queen f2 with the idea of playing g4. I mean, these would be interesting moves. But she she saw a really thematic idea in this opening. It's pretty cool. So takes. Now e5. At first, it doesn't look so clear. It looks like he just loses a pawn. But the point is this crushing move right here. This is the key behind white strategy here. The first point is that uh, taking this pawn loses. White actually has a couple wins, but one I think is more obvious than the other. Knight takes bishop. Well, uh, yeah, knight, knight takes bishop definitely wins. That's that's the computer's first choice. Although the the pretty move is, is rook takes d7, right? Huh. Oh. With the idea of taking on f6. Yeah, you know, taking on g three, you end up just down a piece. But if you if you instead take with a bishop, then knight takes, then bishop takes, and and black is just completely screwed here. So that's a fun little tactic that she's going for. So unfortunately, black has to retreat. Okay, but now f five, just keeping the position closed. And now we also release this bishop mm -hmm. to come attack on the king side. I love how concrete this game, it just flows really nicely. And instead of taking back, just one more threat. G6 is forced. You know, obviously bishop f6, just knight takes. So g6 is absolutely forced. But, you know, white still needs to play accurately. You know, taking the rook would be a mistake. You know, just king takes and black has big compensation for the exchange. So that's not a good idea. So instead, just rook takes. Mm -hmm. Now rook b4. This is a nice move because this knight is an important part of white's attack. And if you're able to trade that, then it's going to help you defend. Bishop d3, f6. And here is where she got a little too ambitious. So rook f1 is very interesting. It's not entirely clear. but. Uh, the computer thinks that if bishop takes f8 was just clearly better. Uh, the idea here is that if king takes, white has this really fun move, knight g5. Mm. <laughs> this this fork on e6 is just absolutely killer. And you're also threatening h7. Yeah, almost almost forces to take the rook, but then white white is really having some fun in this position. But she decided to just keep building up her position with rook f1, which is kind of understandable. I mean, it doesn't look like white has to do anything. So rook takes bishop. This is this is almost necessary because now white really is threatening to take. So now we see, you know, black has a couple pieces for the rook, but you know the king is extremely extremely airy so it's tricky it's tricky to play uh, you know black probably has decent chances here for for drawing or or even getting a good position but uh, it's it's hard to play this position against Bulgar <laughs> so Bishop takes Queen g8 is a threat right this move may look a little funky but it's because Polgar wants to play Queen h4 and attack down here so the bishop on h7 only gets in the way yeah. There's also ideas of blockading the pawn, perhaps. Well, the, the bishop was already doing that on, on h7 okay. too. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think the purpose was basically to clear the way for a queen check on h8. So here comes the queen. Now black is still okay here, but you got to play precisely. Uh, Apparently, you're going to have to play queen b6 here. And then say if king h1, then we have this queen f2 move. Uh, but the point of this is the threat and mate on g2, so bishop h7 is not possible. And we also keep the rook from invading on the 7th because black has mates himself. So this is probably black's best chance. Uh, it doesn't enable white to come crashing through. But he was just too passive. This 96 move, this this is where things really start start going downhill. 
King H1 just as prophylaxis against Queen B6. Threatening Bishop B6. Now black's just in dire straits because C3 is a threat now. And if the knight doesn't go back, the bishop will. Uh, now at this point, black pretty much had to fight the bullet and play an in in-game down the exchange. This was almost forced. And after it takes, White's going to win the exchange because of this hanging bishop. But black will have some compensation. At least with these two bishops, black can try to put up some persistence. But uh, in the game, trying to trying to save the piece does not end well. This bishop on, on d8 ends up being too weak. So check first. And now white has a, a killer blow here. See if you can think like an 11 year old. <laughs> I'm sure all the puzzles she solved helped her with this one. Is there any hope with uh, bishop takes knight and queen check on f8? Yep. Yeah, this move is a killer because even though white's queen is hanging, if bishop f6, Bishop b3, and black has two bishops hanging. Okay. So white's just going to be up in exchange with these two passed pawns. So that's no good. And if black takes the bishop, bishop or queen, then this bishop hangs. Yeah. So again, black's just going to end up down in exchange in a, in a much simplified version. So here, he just threw the towel. <laughs> yeah, by the way, for context, Gutman, you know, he, he was about 40 when this happened. And he, he had just become a GM, too. <laughs> he was probably feeling pretty good himself, you know, just making him a grandmaster, and then <laughs> brought back down to earth. <laughs> Any questions about this game? I wish there was a picture of this, especially when they shook hands. You know, that would be that would be a, that would be a good picture. I looked. <laughs> All right. As Jim Mednis says, you know, no one wanted to lose to a uh, a ten-year-old girl. This creates a couple of ideas. First, there's the idea that uh, she's 10, and second is the idea that she's a girl. And this brings up an important point that I think is kind of an overarching theme of this entire lecture, and that's on the role of gender in uh, Judith Pogar's development. Now, in a couple of ways, po Laszlo Pogar, Dr. Pogar, set out to show that gender is irrelevant, that any person with a proper training can achieve high levels. And to an extent, we can say that his theory is correct. I mean, she reached number eight in the world. But we also have to point out that Judith Pogar was a highly, highly motivated child, as were all three sisters. Well. Perhaps Sophia was the least motivated of them all, but Susan and Judith, I mean, they all worked really hard, um, Judith and Susan in particular. I've read some interesting things about this. A Psychology Today article that I have cited at the end of the, the lecture talks about the fact that the brains and the hormones and the neurotransmitters may be slightly different between the genders, but at a young age, the brain has such neuroplasticity that it can adapt to almost any kind of learning. And, the, and so even though that chess is considered more of a male-dominated thing, if you start early, you can completely nullify that difference. That's one theory. Another theory, and this is kind of espoused by Susan Polgar, she says, well, and I think this is something that she says based on her teaching as well. She says, well, girls don't like to compete as much as boys. Girls like solving problems. They like doing you know, tactics and puzzles and things like that, but they don't like competing. In fact, Susan bemoans the fact that she can go to like a national championship and see very few girls. And Susan's done a, a lot of things to try to counteract this. I read one source which talked about how she opened a chess club in New York and she served like tea and little cakes and stuff like that to try to A, civilize rowdy boys, but B, also encourage girls to, um, to feel welcome. You know, Susan Pogar certainly wants to encourage more girls to play chess at the same level as men. And she also wants chess to be just as popular as, say, golf in terms of television and everything else. So this 
I guess was inculcated by her father, um, who you know is a strong proponent of chess. And I was actually reminded somewhat, although it's different, uh, of the uh, the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, with tennis. The father is considered to have a very strong role in their development as tennis players, but. I think that Laszlo, at least from, from what I've read, seems quite different than Mr. Williams in that he is kind of a more constructive, positive figure, although he is certainly highly demanding. I think he was perhaps a little more healthy. This idea of gender and being discriminated in terms of gender is going to come up quite a bit, and so I want to establish it kind of now because it kind of sets the stage for what happens next. See, in 1988, um, Hungary's National Chess Federation, one of the Polgars, to play for their women's Olympiad team. The Polgars wanted to do that, and so three, all three of them played with one other woman, Hungarian woman, um, and they constituted the Hungarian national team. This is 1988 at the Chess Olympiad in Thessaloniki in, in Greece, and they went there, and the coach of the Soviet team had basically dismissed them, said, oh, well, everybody thinks they're geniuses, or if they're just women you know, with the very derogative tone. And they go there and they eke out a win, they eke out a gold medal, and this was the first time the Soviets had failed to win a gold medal in an Olympiad in like 20 years. And it was almost entirely on the backs of the Polgar sisters. You can see Judith in particular had a very, very strong tournament. 12.5 out of 13, she is 11 years old. She's playing on board two, right? And her performance rating for this tournament, 2694. In the 80s, this is a Kasparov level performance. This is a Karpov level performance. And she's 11. And this sent waves through the chess establishment. It, est it sent waves in a number of different ways. First, it brought a lot of media attention to the family, which was actually a good thing for them because it meant money. Now, the father has always been a stickler for asking for money for interviews. It may sound a little bit like Fisher. And he has a point. They live in a modest apartment in Budapest, and you know they really want to travel to more international tournaments and this, that, and the other, but you know you need funding to do that. So first, you get a lot of media scrutiny, and that brings in money, and Susan actually says, quote, it was one of those few things that permanently changes your life. Until then, we had a lot of doubters and bad wishers. After that, we became national heroes. We could have a summer house and a car. It was almost like winning the lottery. So they go from these very <clears throat> modest accommodations to having you know, some means to continue their work and actually have some leisure with a, with a summer house. And in fact, um, kind of funny, the team was, and instead of Hungary, they were referred to jokingly as Polgaria. They were given a nation of, <laughs> unto themselves. Because they were the, they were the national women's team, essentially. Um, you know, obviously, they needed a fourth player, but it was them. And Mom should have said that, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the parents did play some chess, but they weren't nearly as strong as, as the girls. So at this time, Susan is about 17 and she is not quite a grandmaster yet, but that would come shortly after. And we ha also have to think of the effect this had on the Hungarian Chess Federation. Susan Polgar reportedly earned 11 GM norms before she was given the GM title. Why? Because she was obstructed by the Hungarian Chess Federation. Why? Because Susan showed resistance into playing in women's only tournaments, as did Judith. Judith and Susan and Sophia were notorious from a very early age for refusing to play in women-only tournaments. Judith played in like the under 12 and under 14 world championships, boys and boys in the boys division, and she won both of them. She was world champion in the boys under 12 and the boys under 14 world championship. She refused to be tight. For one, the father said, well, the better competition are the boys, so you're gonna play the boys. But for two, she refused to be handicapped or sidelined or pigeonholed into one particular role. And in fact, you may not know this, but the World Chess Championship used to be called the World Men's Chess Championship until the late 90s. And on that criteria, the Polgar sisters were excluded from participating in the, in the professional and the championship cycle. Now that was changed, and as we'll see later, um, Judith was able to participate in one of those cycles. But from the age of 12 years old, 
Judith Polgar is the highest rated female player in the world. So this is January of 1989 on the FIDE rating list. You see, you know, Kasparov number one and Karpov close behind and then a big, pretty big gap with Nigel Short. For women, Judith Polgar is number one, Susan Polgar is number three. And Judith has a higher ELO rating than the Women's World Championship. She's number two and I can't pronounce her name, so excuse me. But, and she becomes chess royalty. As you see, there's a picture of her visiting the United States and meeting with President Bush and First Lady Barbara Bush. Yeah, thank you. And the Polgar sisters with Judith in the middle. Now, here's an interesting fact. Judith was world number one in January of 1989, and she would keep that rating until, does anybody know? Last year, 2014. About three weeks ago. About three weeks ago, when, or four weeks ago, I guess, when FIDE published their March 2015 rating lists, Ho Yifan had passed Judith Polgar, Judith Polgar, who had retired in August of 2014 and has been inactive since then, and who will disappear, drop off the rating list this August when she goes a year without participating in a tournament. Judith Polgar had been number one in the world for 26 years, from the age of 12 to the age of 39. Now that feat, uh, there's not even been anything close to that on the men's side. And later on, when I show another ELO graph, you'll see just how far ahead she was than uh, the number two person. But she never participated in a Women's World Chess Championship. She refused to on principle. And she probably would have won a lot of them, had she have. Yeah. <laughs> so she began her reign, and later that year in 1989, sorry, later in 1991 actually, Judith got her third norm and became a grandmaster. She became a grandmaster faster than Bobby Fischer did. In fact, when she achieved the Grandmaster title, she was, to that point in history, the youngest person in the world to ever earn the Grandmaster title. Man, woman, doesn't matter. Now, since then, obviously, as we can see, that age has gotten younger and younger, and Sergei Karyakin is um, kind of a freak of chess nature because, my goodness, he you know, blew other people away by a year, 12, not even 13 years old, and he was a GM. That's nuts. But um, Judith Polgar was the first person since uh, 1958, you know, to, to uh, reach the GM title about a month faster than Bobby Fischer, which was just unthinkable. But she had arrived on the scene and everybody knew that she was kind of the heir apparent. People were saying, including uh, Mikael Tal, that she could be a contender for the World Chess Championship. We mentioned Bobby Fischer here, and I want to bring something up. Remember, I told you in the Bobby Fischer lecture that he made an appearance at the Polgar House in 1993 um, when he was kind of on the run for tax evasion charges, and he stayed with the Polgars at their summer house for a while, and he played Fischer random chess. Here he is playing with Susan, who he had kind of a romantic interest in. Judith never talks about that, but he did. Um, and he would analyze games with the girls, and there was even a proposal of course, this is after the Spassky match, for Fisher to play some blitz games with a prize pool and everything against the Polgar sisters. But Bobby, but there was some sort of disagreement between Laszlo, the father, and Bobby Fisher. Maybe the romantic intentions towards Susan, I don't know. Um, but Bobby basically went on record to say, well, of course I'm not going to play them, they're Jews. Now, I should bring that up. Um, the Polgars were all, uh, are all Jews. And uh, Fisher, being the strong anti-Semite that he is, was opposed on principle to pay, playing them for a price pool, but he lived with them for a couple of months. So I, I don't know, but we do know that his anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic tirades, which he would, you know, just go off on, on tangents with from time to time, we do know that the family just kind of put up with them and they kind of uh, girded their teeth. And you know, the father probably called him out on some of them and said, look, Bobby, you got to tone it down. And I'm, I'm sure that there was that too, which really led to a um, kind of a falling out between them. But Fisher did stay with the Pogar family for a while uh, while um, he was in his uh, Budapest period. So Fisher played Spassky in a match and won pretty convincingly. What you may not know is that in 1993, Judith Polgar played Spassky in an arranged match. They played a 10 game match and Polgar won that match 5.5 to 4.5, which is pretty surprising if you think about it. You know, here she is now at this point, 
she's she's 16, 17 years old, so she's not as young, but still she is um, a, a force to be reckoned with. Here's a cross table from Hastings in 1992. At the time, Yevgeny Bereev was number eight in the world, and Judith tied with him. He won on tie breaks for uh, that tournament, for the Hastings tournament. And so she arrived on the international scene. She played in men's tournaments. She was getting invited to some of these tournaments. She was doing well in a lot of these tournaments. She had a really good match record. There was quite a bit of interest in her playing, both in terms of sponsorships and in terms of media attention. And this certainly facilitated her career. But let's take a little image of how she was playing at that time. And so we'll get to game two. Warren said that Shirov is kind of like a male version of Polgar. So let's see what happens in a mirror matchup between the two of them. This was played in Buenos Aires in 1994. And for that, again, I'll turn it over to Warren. Yeah, she's 17 or 18 at the time. Yeah, and as you can expect, there were some fireworks in this one. <laughs> <laughs> <They better be. laughs> All right, so at this point, she was already clearly recognized as one of the top players in the world. I don't know what her ranking was at this time, but uh, I, th I think she was in the top 15 or so. You know, so she was, uh, people, people realized she was not just some kid or some fluke. You know, she had sustained greatness, basically. So uh, as opposed to maybe Gutman, you know, I, I highly doubt Shiroff had any kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, doubts about Polgar's skill. I, I don't think he underestimated her this game. Polgar talked about in her book that she thought Gutman might have kind of underestimated her, but I don't think Shiroff did. So let's delve right in. So the first thing I'll mention is, so we have a Sicilian type Monoff. This was, throughout her whole career, this is one of Polgar's favorite openings. She made a, a huge, huge amount of contribution to this opening. She really developed it. Um, you know, both, both sides of the board, by the way, she would play this opening. So of course, Shiroff is going to play this hyper aggressive move. Uh, although, <clears throat> objectively, the the merits of this is maybe not so so great because normally G4 you can push away a black knight on F6 with tempo, but here it, it's it's kind of hitting on nothing. So um, you know, White's later difficulties can probably be traced to this. This is hardly probably a good idea, but Black still has to be creative because. The normal square for knight and f6 would just justify white's idea. All right. <clears throat> so black has to be careful. You know, knight, knight g7, for example. You know, white might play knight b5. He's got to be careful about these kind of ideas. So that's why a6 first. Okay. Bishop out, and now knight goes to e7. Like we said, and the knight going to f6 would just justify white's plan. The knight retreats. Um, you know that's typical in these kind of positions. If if white wants to attack on the king side, because you know, say for example you play like f4, this would be really stupid because of knight takes, and then black will develop a knight to c6. You know say bishop takes knight c6. That's the common idea when you play knight e7 like this. Uh, and here white just has an awkward position. So that's why white retreats the knight. B5, pairing to Fianchetto this bishop. F4. Now it is interesting that, uh, now I've been explaining the moves, Shiroff had actually played this opening before, and, and Polgar had looked at one of his games, and she came up with a novelty here. <clears throat> and it's interesting when, when I look at this position, you know, it's one of the first moves I think of, but it's because I recall. A, a, it's a Polov game and a Nidorf, not a Taimanov, where this idea was played. Uh, and I, I wonder if Topolov got his idea from Polgar. But as far as I know, this was a novelty at the time. Do uh, you guys want to guess what she played? Maybe F5? F5 is a good guess. Um, here, here, I actually don't think it's a good idea because why can Castle Queenside? Because I actually don't oh. think F5 threatens anything. No, but it gets black some space and uh, oh, yeah, it's the attack. It's interesting, yeah. But here, I don't think it's quite a good idea. 
And also, if, if he takes with the e-pond, that diagonal is opened up for the black bishop. Yeah, right. Knight, uh, knight b4. Knight b4, I think, just castles queenside. Yeah, knight g6 is one of the more obvious moves, but again, white's going to castle queenside. Stop. Do you play something like g6 to try to fiancate out of that bishop? To uh, you're on the right path. Break up a castle king queenside position? Yeah, so I'll mention one thing about one, one of the downsides of moving your, your pawn so early in the opening is that they create a lot of weaknesses. They can't go back. Right. And here, an interesting positional point is that with the pawns on e4 and g4, white has irreparably weakened these dark squares. Um, the dark squares being e5 and g5. Okay, so think of how you can take advantage of this. I find it kind of amazing. What's that? Well, e5 is the right idea, but not quite the right implementation because, again, White's going to castle queenside, and by taking on f4 now, you would bring another piece that attacks d6. Yeah. G5, is it? What's that? Yeah. G went the other way. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's. I just other people a chance. I think I think it's amazing that she found this move in the pre-computer era. Interestingly, when I when I plugged in Houdini, Houdini says, "Oh, obviously G5. It's the best move." Oh, but I find it amazing that she found this move in the pre-computer era. It's just weird because you did your king's out in the middle still. I mean, it, yeah. it seems like okay. it seems completely illogical. But the purpose is you want the e5 square at any cost. Yeah, it, it really is cool. And notice the difference here between also going back with with e5 by playing e5 and, and then taking. Okay. We, we trade off a, a piece that controls d5 and f5, okay? So you're actually creating a couple new weaknesses. Of your own. By playing g5, you don't create any new weaknesses except, except for f6. So, so what you're creating a hole for your, your knight, basically. Exactly. Okay, okay. So the difference between the moves is that g5 gains control of b5 without sacrificing d5 and f5, which could be useful. It does give, give a control of f6, but you know, white's pieces are far from being able to exploit that. So g5 is just a really cool move. Now, the, the, the Topolov game I was talking about, that was in a, a knight or flying in an English attack. That's where they play you know, bishop e3, queen d2. And the idea there is the same. It's, it's a pawn sacrifice in that opening as well. But I, I am curious now, you know, I, I wish I could even ask Topolov, you know, did you get that g5 idea from Polgar? You know, it's, it's funny when you see these strategical themes across opening. Anyway, apparently when she played this, you know, Shiroff was happy when he got position after queen f3, I guess, kind of tell his mood, but then after g5, she played it instantly. He, I guess he was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't consider this. <laughs> so he just took it. Uh, this actually surprised Polgar. Uh, you know, she thought maybe just cast the queen side, try to get increased in development. Because all of those wins upon, it seeds the e5 square with tempo. So white's going to end up in some difficulties. <coughs> so queen g2, trying to hold on to both e4 and g4, right? Because if you play like queen g3, b4, it immediately puts enormous pressure on white because that e4 pawn is toast. So queen g2 looks awkward, but it's the only way to maintain it. And now b4. So we're moving this knight from the center. So he's got to go here, a4. In retrospect, uh, knight a4 is probably slightly better if only to allow white's bishop to still play. Because this bishop being hemmed in causes white problems, as you'll see. And now another really cool move. She played h5. <laughs> so it's kind of a clever idea. So if, if white takes, then black can take on h6 and try to trade even more dark square defenders from white. And these dark squares, these weaknesses will become even more pronounced. So I think it's really clever. And of course, uh, if, if white takes on h5, she had an idea in mind. Okay. Uh, by the way, she does, she does mention in her book that, um, isn't this move? Or sorry, I, I think it's one move further here. 
Okay, so Sheeroff took... Uh, already at this point, it's hard to suggest anything different, by the way, because if you just allow knight takes g4, it's again with tempo. So it's hard to say what white can do already. But he took... Uh, and here, Polgar came with knight f5. Another nice tempo. It's just attacking the bishop, right? It looks like white's doing okay after bishop f2, but you'll see what she has in mind. Uh, she does mention that uh, f5 would have been a very interesting move to <laughs> trying to exploit the pin on this diagonal. Pretty, pretty interesting. But not, not f5 is good too. Bishop f2 is the obvious move, controlling h4, safeguarding the bishop, but black has a fun move here. What do you think Polgar played? What about just rook takes h5? You're, you're, uh... You get your rook out of the game. Uh, rook h5. Hmm. I think just h4. And I think black's initiative is kind of dying down. White can castle queen side next. Yeah, getting that rook back in the middle of the game again. So it gets yeah. No, black can play oh, much wait, more oh, energetic. Oh, take, take the uh, rook. No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fork with that. Yeah. Just take. Oh, oh, yeah. The point being, if queen takes, knight check, yeah. and takes, and this knight is still immune because of this pin yeah. right. on the a8 h1 diagonal, yeah. and white's gonna win this pawn. And white can't castle anymore. Yeah, and white's king is stuck in the center. Yeah, white's getting crushed here. Yeah. No, no doubt. So the queen is immune. Queen g5 definitely gotta be a satisfying move to play. But knight a5. So white's trying to get rid of this pesky bishop on the long diagonal. Okay. But unfortunately it's not so great. Ninety three. Just a killer move. Now the point is that if takes, takes, the bishop is not capturable because of the mate. <laughs> so the bishop is untouchable. And of course if white takes, then again we have these dark squared holes and white's position's looking like Swiss cheese, right? So the knight can't really be captured. So white has to play this disgusting looking move queen g3, right? So now e4 is hanging. Uh, now she decided to trade queens. Now Mr. Houdini thinks that knight takes c2 yeah, is better. And then after king d1, queen takes h5, keeping the queens on the board. Hmm. Now it's kind of a funny position. The point is that the bishop is immune because then black takes the rook, okay? And the knight is immune because then white loses this rook. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I, I guess you can't blame Bogar, Polgar for missing this, but uh, Mr. Houdini thinks this was quite crushing because white has a hard time dealing with all the threats. Bishop b4, knight a1. I mean, it's just it's disgusting. Uh, but she decided to trade queens, which it, it is not complicated, by the way. So she missed her chance at a miniature. Well, you know, she she was playing fast anyway, so yeah. she kind of already did. But yeah, not nice c two. The Houdini gives it at about plus five, plus six for black. But queen g three, it's only plus two. You know, so nice c two would have been absolutely killer. But you know, this is pretty clearly yeah, good too, because you just win an exchange. Yeah. Knight b seven. The knight may look like it's getting stuck, but you can play b three and fetch it out. And now we have this this end game position where she just has an extra exchange for nothing. So why create the isolated pawn there? Uh, well, I think well, the black knight had nowhere else to go. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. Good choice. I was gonna say repeat moves, but knight didn't want to be risky, right? Um. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think it was it was pretty much forced. Okay. Why why, why was the uh, the two holes on the the, the dark squares again, d4 and f4, why was that critical? I mean, you still left after the trade of queen. Oh, well, well, they were they were holes in that... Uh, are you talking about the, the middle game position? Yeah, the middle game position, when you were referring to the, the, the dark square, having the dark square. Okay. Yeah, I'll talk about that. So, you know, a knight, a knight can be anchored in the center. It's very powerful, right. right? And so, by playing g4 early in the opening... By the way, I'll just go back briefly. Going back to this position, by playing g4, white reduces his ability to control f4 because if white loses his f4 pawn, 
he can't replace it with a G pawn. You know, like if if the pawn were on G two and Black played G five, White could play G three, and then White could maintain control over that four square. No, no, I, I, it's a little bit further on. It was okay. beyond that. It was yeah. It was after this. You mean after here? Yeah, after there, right and there. Taken? Yeah. Or just why on the D4 and F4 you circled those two as mm -hmm. critical squares, and I guess I was I didn't understand why the, why was that important at that point. The oh well, square. well, well here it's important because the white knight has nowhere to go that can be of, of any importance basically. I mean here there's lots of things going against white, not just dark square weaknesses. I mean uh, this threat to the E4 pawn is killer. The mate threat, you know, it, it's hard to really suggest too much. Uh, the dark square but, weakness is being that he doesn't have a dark square bishop. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's a general theme in like this uh, in the Sicilian and a lot of these knight dwarf positions or Taimanov positions where white will play e4 and g4. It's a theme that that weakens dark squares. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. So after after the exchange of queens and the win of the exchange, she mopped up pretty easily. They played a few more moves, but uh, he didn't resist too much longer. Of course, the, the pawn is untouchable because the king ends up in some, some dire straits here. <laughs> and here he just resigned. But he was, he was effectively crushed. I mean, uh, Lu Lucas was mentioning uh, Polgar apparently, you know, he was half an hour, 45 minutes. You know, she didn't think very long in this game. It was mostly prep. <laughs> you know, she prepped this g5 move, h5. You know, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, any questions about this game? All right. Now, going into this, I had a question about, you know, I've, I've talked about gender a little bit, and I had a question about how gender affected the chess world because chess until this point was kind of a good old boys club you know all the people competing at the highest level were men and there was some disparaging comments about women and their abilities and we'll get into what Kasparov said here in a bit um, and I wondered was there any you know lewdness shown toward the girls um, or was there any you know, untoward advances or anything like that. Um, and, and, and so I was curious if the girls, and particularly Judith, were somehow uh, sexualized in a sense because they were women. Now, you know, Judith is a very photogenic person. She takes, you know, great pictures. And um, I wouldn't say that she's scantily clad. You don't, you're not going to find any pictures of her in a bikini. She's not in Sports Illustrated or Maxim or anything like that. Um, you know, but she's not averse to, to, to showing some leg every now and then. And I wondered if she tried to use any, you know, feminine wiles or if that came up at all. And I couldn't find anything on it. Um, and, 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 and I'll tell you, if ever there's a movie made about um, Judith Polgar's life, I'm going to save Hollywood some time. I'm going to serve as casting director, and I'm going to suggest Natalie Portman. Just saying. Yeah, I think I, th I think there's a strong case to be made there that uh, that that uh, Natalie Portman could could uh, pull that off. Just saying. You can send me a royalty check in the mail later on. I couldn't find any evidence to support the idea that she was sexualized. In fact, she seemed to be treated with quite a bit of deference and respect to the credit of the players at the time, other than some snarky comments about, you know, women and their general abilities. In fact, Smyslov had my favorite quote. He called her towel in a skirt. And I think that's just great praise. Number one, I don't really think Polgar wore uh, skirts that often, but number two, she had some Talas qualities. Boy, she could attack. Boy, she could sacrifice. And she had a crazy stare. She was known for her focus and determination at the board. And I see, um, I see echoes of Kasparov and Tal and some of those other people who had great stares when I look at um, pictures of Polgar and her focus at a chessboard. And, you know, a lot of... Uh, the chess players at the time will talk about how I love this quote by Jim David Norwood this cute little auburn haired monster who would crush you, you know. 
In a sense, she may have been underestimated a bit. You know, some of the players may have felt, felt fatherly or grandfatherly or, or something, but she disabused them of that pretty quickly. And so I think that she earned respect through her focus, through her determination, and through her success. If you go to her website, she talks about all of the world champions that she has defeated. I'll save you the point of counting. There are 10 of them. 10 current or former world champions have been defeated by Judith Polgar, either in classical time controls, rapid, blitz, something. She has beaten all of these people listed. And we can agree that they are 10 of the top players who have ever been. You know, beating Kasparov and Karpov, those people would probably be in everybody's top five. And beating Anna, and that's in some people's top 10. And, you know, she's beaten Topolov and Carlson, who's obviously number one in the world right now. And granted, Carlson was younger then, and he's stronger now. And nowadays, there wouldn't be much of a contest. But she's beaten all of these people, going all the way back to um, Vasily Smyslov, actually. I find that fascinating. Now, I talked a little bit about Kasparov's views on gender. Let's get into what Gary had to say. You'll remember in Child of Change, where I talked about how Kasparov said it was fantasy to think that a woman would ever be world champion. I said only in the fiction books can that happen. And in 1990, Kasparov was saying, well, you know, she has talent, but she's a woman. <laughs> no woman could sustain, could sustain us a prolonged battle. And Kasparov thought that women just couldn't keep the fighting spirit and the nervous energy going for the six hours necessary to complete a, a long chess match and just felt that it was just that they had weaker psyches. Well, he changed his tune. In 2007, in his book, How Life Imitates Chess, he says the Polgar showed there are no limitations and that, um, and he doesn't come out and just say that I was wrong about women, but he kind of says I was pretty much wrong about uh, at least the Polgars. So he changed his tune. It, it took him a while to, to come around to that. And they had a pretty long and interesting history. And I, I want to just briefly touch on that. First, their first game that they played was in, their first known game was in Linares in 1994. That was their first uh, rated across the over the board game. They may have played a little bit before that. There's some talk about Kasparov observing her games at like Thessaloniki in 1988 and just looking at her making really good moves and nodding, you know, with approval. But their first match was in 1994, and this was one of the first big tournaments that Judah Pogar was invited to. And there was a controversy here. The controversy was the touch move controversy. And, and this was something I talked a little bit in the Kasparov lecture, and I said I was gonna get into it in the Polgar lecture. What happened is Kasparov was pretty much, and Polgar knew that she was pretty much lost in the position. And I just wanna read what she says in her book. This is actually volume two of her, of her kind of autobiography. And she says, she's taking up the commentary from move 36. Says, my last move was knight b3 to d2. White's position is close to losing, and I only had two minutes on the clock to reach move 40. So she's made her 36 move, 36 move. She has to make four more moves in two minutes, compared with Kasparov's five minutes. In this position, Kasparov played knight c5, but then put the knight back on d7. This only lasted an instant, but happened in front of numerous witnesses. The famous Linares organizer, Don Luis Rentero, and the chief arbiter, Carlos Falcone, were standing next to the board. The spectators' areas was full, and there was even a remote camera filming the game. I quickly looked up at Gary and then turned my face to Rentero and Falcone so as to give them a hint that something out of order had just happened. I was convinced that Gary had released his fingers from his knight before canceling the move. It is easy to understand that he noticed in the last moment, or shortly after it, the knight on c5 interferes along the c-file, allowing bishop c6 with a double attack. True subsequent analysis showed that black can draw, blah, 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 blah. It says, while I, looked, while I was looking around in confusion, Gary kept thinking. I suppose he was mainly asking himself whether his fingers had really lost contact with the knight and waiting to see whether I or the arbiter would make any comment. The main question that comes to mind is, why did I not say anything? The answer is complex and involves several aspects. Imagine I was playing at Linares at the age of 17. I started the game as the underdog, and my position was objectively lost. I did not like the prospect of being suspected of trying to win a lost position by launching an unfair accusation against such an outstanding authority as Gary Kasparov, and I certainly did not want my first ever invitation to Linares to be my last. 
As if all these factors were not enough to inhibit me, I also had some anxieties about what would happen if my process was overruled. I knew something about a rule according to which the arbiters might take away two minutes from my clock, but that was all the time I had left. Of course, this was a case of misunderstanding of the rules on my part. The time deduction does not apply in cases where a player will be left with less than two minutes as a result of the time penalty. In this particular scenario, an unsuccessful protest on my part would have resulted in two minutes being added to Kasparov's clock. Anyway, with all these thoughts buzzing around in my mind, I decided that since I was already losing the game, I should just sit and wait for the outcome of the situation. Kasparov used up three of his remaining five minutes, and since neither I nor the arbiter said anything, played on, played knight f8. She says, you know, that she later on um, lodged a protest, but the, the arbiters at that point had their hands tied because a, a protest like that needs to be claimed during the match, not after it, so they were unable to change the outcome of the match. There is persistent video evidence. You can find the video on YouTube where it looks very um, clear that Kasparov had let go of the piece. Kasparov will deny that to this day, but, you know, that bottom picture looks pretty... Uh, convincing, and that was published in the newspaper. So there was some controversy around this incident. But you can understand that Pogar would have been very reluctant to to call out the world champion, you know, when she is in her first, one of her first major tournaments. Incidentally, this loss demoralized Pogar. She went on to lose most of her remaining matches, and she did not have a very strong result, therefore, in the Linares tournament. She started out well, but after this, she was uh, distraught. And she recovered, but this was their first over-the-board meeting, and it certainly didn't do much to disabuse Kasparov of his opinion about the prowess of women in chess. Luckily, she would have her revenge, if you will. In 2002, there was an event called Kasparov versus the World. It was played with a rapid time control. I think it was like 15 minutes or 25 minutes plus 10 seconds per move or something like that. Polgar won pretty convincingly. What had happened was Polgar was white and she played e4 and Kasparov re responded with e5, which was very odd. He normally was a pretty consistent Sicilian player. But it actually went into a Rui Lopez and a Berlin defense. And what Polgar did, which is actually quite clever, is she played a line that Kasparov himself had played when Kramnik played the Berlin defense. And she improved on it somewhat, got an advantage in the opening, and Kasparov played king c8, and then before Pogar uh, made her next move, he resigned. What would Pogar have played? Yeah, rook takes a7 with the mate threat on rook a8, right? So that um, so the pawn on on f2 is for the moment immune from capture, and what this would result in is Pogar being up two pawns in an end game and it's a pretty clear-cut win from this position. So Kasparov resigned. Reportedly, he got up, he shook hands, got up, and just, I don't want to say fled the playing hall, but he made a hasty exit. Let's call it that, a hasty <laughs> exit from the playing hall. Did not talk to the media. That was the first time a woman had been the world number one. So she did get her, her vengeance. Pogar had a long history with a lot of players, which brings us to perhaps her best game of all time. I don't know if this is, some people say the game against Shirov was Pogar is immortal. Some people say this was the best, um, most beautiful game of chess ever played by a woman. It's, it's debatable what her best game was, but in 1999 she played Annan. He was not yet the world champion, but he was considered kind of the king of chess. And uh, she, she won this game. And, you know, she, she uh, gave an interview in, with a Spanish newspaper. This was in Madrid, and I think she gave that interview in Spanish, but I translated it. Uh, it's true that Annan had a positive record, a pretty convincingly positive record against Pogar, but in this game, she outplayed him. So for that, again, I'll turn it over to Warren for our final game of the night. So if you know a little bit about chess history, uh, Anand had already played a match with Kasparov for the World Championship. And I think at the time he was ranked number three. Uh, I think the ranking was Kasparov followed by Kramnik, and then Anand was number three. You know, at the time, you know, Anon was very strong. Uh, you now I've told you about our prowess in the Sicilian. Guess what opening we're gonna have? <laughs> Another Sicilian. <laughs> you know, I, I have tried, generally speaking, in a lecture series to avoid, you know, picking games of the same opening. 
for for every player. But for for this, you know, it, she she had so many cool Sicilian games. It, it's hard it's hard not to pick them. You know, like the Kasparov game was one example where it was not a Sicilian. But you know, I didn't pick it because you know she just crushed them basically. <laughs> it was no contest, so I don't think it was very interesting. This this was though. Yeah, it was said that she beat him in a Karpov esque style, positional style. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was kind of her her winning against Kasparov was kind of more unusual. Uh, you know, I I think she chose to go into Endgame. You know, like Lucas said, because Kasparov had just finished. You know, very recently, one two years ago with Kramnik and and beat beating his head against the wall trying to beat the Berlin. So then he tries it himself. And then he just psychologically, he just can't reserve, reverse the roles. <laughs> you know, Polgar played the novelty. And he was like, oh. You know, I, I imagine you when Polgar played the novelty against him in that Berlin game, he was just thinking as soon as she played it, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Kasparov, you know, and his, his tales of getting distracted by novelties, I wouldn't be surprised. You know. Anyway, so we have a night where Nan was, was very good with this opening. He's been a good Sicilian player himself throughout his career. And Polgar goes in for, you know, like her style, a very sharp line with G4. G4 is very sharp. Now it's similar to the Karras attack, except that black has a pawn A6, and white has a bishop on A3. Arguably an improvement for black, because the B5 square is really important to control. Okay. So black has some non-critical continuations, you know, black can play H6, and that's fine. Um, in fact, this, this H6 line, is resulted in the Topolov game that I was talking about earlier. In that in that game, Black ended up playing G5 as a pawn sacrifice too. But anyway, he played E5, which is the critical continuation. So the first thing you'll notice is that G4 is hanging, right? Now we have Bishop and Knight both attacking it. So Knight F5 is the only move. You can't go to B3 like you normally would in these kind of positions. And now, G6. Now this move is incredibly risky. <laughs> At the time, the theory was still being developed, and it was kind of immature. Uh, nowadays, the preferred move is h5, and the idea behind this move now is that if g5, then you have knight takes e4. So this is the preferred theoretical preference now, because even though in the game, black ends up winning a piece, white gets enormous compensation. So the first thing to mention is that if knight h6, this leaves g4 kind of unprotected, right? So instead of that, g5, a counterattack. Uh, now, by the way, white can also play bishop g2, but g5 is a much more forceful and complicated line. So instead of taking the knight, white takes the pawn. By the way, if you take, this isn't so good because f4. And this bishop is not going to have green pastures. Okay, It's going to go to D2 or C1, and both, it's terrible. So this is not White's intention. White plays this as a real pawn sacrifice. Okay, Now, moving the knight for black subjects him to a huge attack. I mean, if you just play like knight fd7, just routine, after bishop c4, White has a ferocious attack. I mean, queen h5, g6, it's a lot of fun. So moving the knight's a hard leave acceptable. So d5, tactical point. So if you take the knight, then d4 will fork and black get the piece back. So this allows black to get some breathing space for his pieces too. But queen f3, the idea now that we can beat the fork with castle and queen side. So white merely increases his de her development. I say his by, by instinct. <laughs> I have to catch myself. <laughs> yeah, now, now the point for white is that development is really accelerating rapidly here. And black just spent two moves in a row moving a pawn. Okay. So knight b7. Uh, other moves are just really risky. Uh, in most every case, white's going to take on f6, followed by bishop c4. Whoops. And white's going to have a really strong attack. So knight d7. Bishop back. You want to keep those bishops, of course. I, I like this move. And now white's down two full pieces. But white just has huge compensation. You know, one point is that if knight g8, white has a couple of attractive continuations. You can play bishop c4, or you can play f6, just to lock that knight in its cage, right? You may notice after f6 that this knight's never gonna move. 
So you, you've got some fun possibilities. So Anon didn't want to have any of that. So he's trying to get Castle. Uh, this is really provocative. Uh, I, I believe current theory, you know, Queen C7 is a preferred move, but this is so messy. I mean, you don't you don't see a whole lot of modern game day, uh, modern day games on this line. You know, even though Black is up a piece, two pieces right now, White just has such huge compensation. It's it's not considered a fun line for Black. So Bishop G7, Rook G1, refusing to take it. Again, if you move the knight, White's just going to play F6. The initiative's only going to grow. Well, at that point, why don't you just sack the, the knight at that point? What's that? Yeah. You have to Rook G1? <laughs> yeah, oh, no, after knight goes to, to G, G8 and he pushes the pawn. I don't know. Oh, you mean here, F6? And then just take the pawn with the knight. Oh, it's, it's probably best, yeah. yeah okay. it, just, it just opens more lines. I mean, right. Black would prefer to try to keep the F file closed. So that's why he'd prefer to leave the knight and sack it there. So castles, this is definitely a bold decision, as, as Polgar notes. But you know, then again, it's it's not like the king in the center looks much healthier. So it's it's hard to really criticize an aunt. Uh, what I find fascinating now is the energy with which Polgar plays. Just every move just has a nasty threat. So now we take, we open up this G file. This is nice. Now we need three. This has a nasty threat. Black has to be careful. I mean, for example, say black plays b5, trying to counterattack maybe. You know, white has a crushing blow here. Yep. The point being e5 falls. Bishop takes, bishop e5. And black's just getting killed. So black has to defend, king h8. Now we relieve this pin on the G file, right? But now, F4. So again, renewing the threat of mm -hmm. Rook takes D7 and Bishop B5. Still there. So Queen B6, trying to trade Queens and get rid of that threat. But now Queen G3, threatening mate. Queen H6, this threatens to trade Queens and guards a Bishop, right? Rook D6. Another cool move, right? So you can't take the rook because of mate. You can't take an f4 because bishop g7, right? So f6, again, the only real possibility. You know, knight f6, just bishop e5. It's not good. Now bishop d2, threatening f takes e. So e4, closing off that diagonal. And now bishop c4. And now white gets that bishop active. And this is just such a fun position to look at. White's pieces are so active. Even though black's up a piece, it hardly feels like it. Because he's way on that, that last one, that's threatening you made of G8, right? Bishop C4? No, the other bishop opposite. Yeah, here, here white's just improving her position. There's no immediate threat, but you know, untangling black's position is hard to accomplish. So B5, trying to get this rook into the game on the seventh rank. Bishop b6. Uh, now, Houdini mentions, and she mentions in her book too, bishop d5 was more accurate. Uh, with the reason being that bishop b6, black can trade a pair of pieces, which helps. Although white still has a fun position. Uh, yeah, rook a7 was not a good idea. Uh, who, Mr. Houdini says knight c5, and it might be playable for black. Uh, Polgar disagrees, but uh, it's still kind of interesting. At least this way, black can trade either a bishop or a knight. So that's the point here. But rook a7, now it's too slow. This rook attacks a bishop, so the knight's stuck. So a5, it's hard to suggest anything else. Bishop d5, the nasty threat of rook c8, right? So rook down. Now again, black can't move the bishop, can't move the knight because the bishop hangs. It's just, he's tied up in knots. B3. Now the rook has some breathing space, but now he just gets forked. And now, white to play. White has a nice move. Rook takes c8. Exactly. Oh, yeah, you could play bishop, bishop takes d7, but rook takes c8 is more oh, precise. Oh, double attack. Exactly. So rook takes c8, bishop d7. 
This way, white is able to keep a rook, a black rook, off of the back rank. This is useful. He got her takes, takes. Now white switches the rook over to this side. Nasty. King g8, queen g2, and at this point, Nan just gave up. White has some nasty threats. I mean, for example, queen g6, you could take on e4, say rook h5, and then you have moves like uh, f5 here. You know, for example, queen takes, check, and check, right? It's Black's pieces are just too uncoordinated to meet these threats in the back rank. And they never got coordinated. Yeah, uh, this black queen sat on h6 idle the whole game pretty much. You know, it arrived there how many moves ago on move 19, and she was not heard of the rest of the game. <laughs> so I wonder she was she down two pieces though. That's amazing. I mean, you were down two pieces for. Uh, it was it was a number of moves. She was down two pieces for. Uh, well, I, I guess it was only a couple moves, because she lost the knight, and then a couple moves later she won it back. But then when you're, when you're down two pieces, it feels like eternity. <laughs> it's not it's not very often in chess you can afford such a luxury, right? So, At what point in this game was she, like Lucas's, Lucas's quote, when, when was she certain that she was just sitting back and enjoying this game? Like, did she say in the book when, uh, when she realized that? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think I remember her talking about the, the position after... Um, she played, I think, bishop e6. I remember her talking about that and saying she was pretty satisfied. Okay. Um, I mean, just, just optically looking at this, you know, it's this. Oh, well, there's no doubt. Yeah. Think, yeah. How, it, could, how could she not do Yeah, even though white's down a piece, I mean, if I was white, I'd feel pretty comfortable. Black's pieces are so tied down, you know, this queen can never move. Neither can the bishop because of the mate on g8. You know, it's. In, in these positions, you know, you know, I've talked about before, you know, you have those three ways of outing a position, right? You have time, material, and quality of position. Here, the quality of white's position is just yeah. obviously overwhelming. It just, uh, the material disadvantages is nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing you see, you don't see a non-crush like this very often, so it's, it's pretty amazing what she was able to do. It, it looks like from her tone that she felt pretty good after um, Anand's move queen h6 and her reply rook d6. <laughs> yeah, rook d6. That's definitely a satisfying move optically. It just pins everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a local Houston player who would refer to this position as pin city. You know? <laughs> yeah, any questions about this game? Yeah, pretty yeah, fun. She, she says after, after move 28 b3, uh, she says this move underlining black's utter helplessness made me exceedingly happy. <laughs> Defeating a world-class player in such a way is quite an achievement. During the game, I sensed it was precisely at this point that Anand lost all real hope of saving the game. Later, I heard that his second, Elzabar Ubalava, was most impressed by my last move, although he was less than happy when it appeared on the board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun game. Okay, so a little bit left to get through. As I mentioned, she had a pretty long history with um, Anand. Going back to really the first picture I could find between, with the two of them was 1993 when they, uh, they're, they're playing against an early version of Fritz here, I believe, and they're, they're um, I, I guess, collaborating. Um, Frederick Friedel says, tells a funny story about him walking in and them realizing that their position's completely lost and and he's saying and he's saying quick hit control s to save it you know because he wants to see it and at, and Ananda's is saying quick control n to start a new game <laughs> and she pressed control n so it depriving Friedel of the opportunity to see you know how um, his you know how Fritz had done against them but anyway they were through promotional means they were matched up quite often 2001 you see it was the match was billed as the king meets the queen and in 2000 even up to 2012 they were still playing over the board against one another I mean that's well over 20 years uh, of their history and you see the match record heavily favored Anand um, 15 wins to Polgar's four so that's 
pretty lopsided. Now, altogether, Pogar's match record against other GMs was pretty good. Um, against, I think it was, was Gris Chuk, she had a positive score. Against um, Jan Tinman, she had a crushing score. And so she availed herself pretty well against some of the top players in the world at the time. But some people had a, uh, their style just worked very well against her. Anand was one, another was Kramnik. I don't think Kramnik ever lost a match to her in classical time controls. Um, and he, he's one of the notable world champions that she doesn't list among her uh, wins. In fact, he's pretty much the only notable absence for the past 20 years or so. So her best year by far in terms of rating and in terms of result was 2005. 2005, she hits her peak FIDE rating of 2735. So 2700 is largely agreed to be super GM level, okay? And there's only one woman who's ever achieved that rating, and that's Judith Polgar. No other woman has ever broken 2700 yet. Ho Yifan might um, pass that, that mark soon. She's at 2680 something, so she's close, and she seems to be on an upward trajectory. But 2735 is, is quite the peak. And um, in 2005, she also got to play in the candidates tournament to determine actually the world chess champion. And she lost that tournament pretty convincingly. She didn't do very well in the double round robin. And I, so I, um, didn't, I, I didn't bring the cross table to show you. And in fact, her inclusion in that tournament was kind of a last minute thing because Kasparov had refused to play because he had retired. And, um, and so his spot went to, or, and, and Kramnik had refused to play because he thought he should be automatically seated in the final to play like the winner of the candidate cycle. So Kramnik's spot went to Peter Svidler, and um, Kasparov's spot went to Polgar. And um, so there were eight players, and I think Polgar finished seventh or eighth, and Svidler finished third or something, but that was won by Topalov, actually. So he became the world champion until they had a, a, a match in 2006 between Topalov and Kramnik, in which Kramnik won barely, and that's the, the world championship with the famous bathroom incident. Yeah, that's, that's a fun one. Um, but that's beyond the scope of tonight's lecture. So 2005, best year ever, and if you wonder how she compared against other grandmasters, here are the top 100, air quote, men in October of 2005 on the FIDE rating <laughs> list. And the only woman in the top 100, actually, on this list is Judith Polk. Her rating at the time, at 2735, made her number eight in the world. And you see that she is in some pretty esteemed company. Obviously, Kasparov had the better rating, even though he had retired. You know, he hadn't yet gone inactive because it had been less than a year since he retired. So he's still on the rating list. And there you have Anand, you have Topalov, who was the reigning world champion. Uh, Peter Leko, uh, fellow Hungarian actually, Ivanchuk, uh, Svidler, Kramnik, and Polgar right, right, right behind them. I mean, she's within five rating points of being number six in the world. So she's really, really close. And it's all the more impressive to think that she had to her best year in 2005 after going inactive for a while in 2004 because of the birth of her first son. So, oh, incidentally, does um, Judith Polgar's rating at this point is uh, 2735. Does anybody know the rating of the next highest rated woman and who that woman was? So the woman was Susan Polgar, oh, okay. who was number two in the world. It's not, not all that surprising. Susan Polgar's rating at the time was somewhere around 2570, which means that Judith Polgar's rating was over 150 points higher than the number two woman in the world. And I said earlier that Judith Polgar never competed in world chess championships, world women's chess championships, neither, neither did Susan actually. And I said that, you know, it's probably, there probably wasn't much point because she would have won most of them. And at 150 ELO points higher than the next closest competition who didn't even compete in the women's world chess championship, she would have been somewhere around 180 points higher than the number two or than the maybe current women's world champion. And, and um, that's a pretty huge distinction in ELO rating, particularly at that level. So I mentioned the birth of her first son. Judith married a veterinarian, a veterinary, a veterinary surgeon actually, by the name of Gustav. You see him there pictured in 2000. She has two children, Oliver and Hannah. 
it's kind of a funny picture <laughs> with her, you know, trying to teach him chess and he just wants to eat the pieces. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> and so during this time, Judith actually went inactive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she went inactive to, to raise, you know, to spend the first six months a year with her family or with her children. And afterward, even though she still did very, very well, she talks about the fact that for most of her life she had sacrificed pretty much everything for chess, but that she had considered, uh, she had started to consider that there are some things that may be more important. So even though she peaked in 2005, she never reached this peak again. I think she finished when she retired in 2014 with an ELO around 2680, 2680 something. And as I mentioned, Ho Yi Fan recently surpassed her on the March uh, 2015 rating list to become the highest rated female player in, in FIDE and, and obviously the uh, potential successor to Judith Polgar's legacy. So she did retire. She retired in 2014 at the Olympiad in Tromsø, Norway. That was incidentally where Garry Kasparov lost the FIDE election to um, Kursan Yumazam. It was also notable for Judith Polgar's official retirement from chess. On the Hungarian team, the men's team, because she always, after the 1988 Olympiad, and I think the 1992 Olympiad as well, after that she always played for the men's team. And she won a couple of uh, silver medals with them uh, in 2002 and then in 2014. After winning that silver medal with the uh, Hungarian men's team, I think she's on board two or board three, she uh, retired. Now, obviously she was still fiercely strong, uh, almost still super GM level, but she had decided that, and I can't say I blame her, that at the age of 38 or 39 and after 26 years as the number one player, or 25 years as the number one player in the world, and after devoting 35 years almost to, to chess, that um, that she would still keep up with chess in some way, shape, or form, but that she would uh, focus on other ventures as well. So what she's done in the interim is she's been working a lot on curriculum. You may not know this, but Judith Pogar currently lives in Budapest. She's actually the only Pogar still living in Budapest. Her older sister Susan moved to New York after marrying an American in, I think, 1999. And uh, then Susan went to various places. You may know that she was at Texas Tech University for a good bit and helped establish a chess program there, take them to national prominence. Now she's at Webster University in St. Louis. She's also associated with the um, Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. And with she heads the chess program at Webster University and they have won the past couple of, um, of NCAA, or not, I don't think they're in NCAA, but university championships in chess. And it's a very, very prestigious program, and she gives lectures. You can find videos of her on YouTube, and she is a, a veritable repository of chess information and is still devoting quite a bit of her life to chess. So Susan is in the St. Louis area. Judith is in Budapest with her husband and two children. And she's somewhat of a celebrity there. You can see her on billboards for like cell phones and she's been awarded medals by the Hungarian government and she's designed a curriculum that's been implemented in lower in elementary schools in Hungary to teach chess. Sophia, the middle sister, is in uh, Israel, I believe in Tel Aviv. She married, you know, the whole family minus uh, Susan and Judith moved to uh, Israel. Originally, Sophia moved with the parents Laszlo and Clara to Canada, but then she married an Israeli citizen and moved back to Israel where she currently lives with her two children. So I believe all three sisters have two children, interestingly enough, and they're very spread out. These sisters who spent all their time together, one of them's in Israel, one of them is in Budapest, and one of them is in the United States. So that's, that's quite the spread, and the parents are in Canada. It seems very strange to me because if you look at Laszlo and his quotes from like the 1990s, he's talking about, well, we did this with our children, and we're going to do this with our grandchildren, and you know that that hasn't really come to pass. Susan talks a little bit about trying to implement um, Laszlo's pedagogy with her own children, but says it's really hard because she divorced her husband and became a single parent, and you know that didn't really work. I told you I was going to tell you a, a, a funny story about Laszlo's attempts to continue his research. So there is a fairly wealthy, uh, I believe he's Dutch billionaire, who is kind of a friend of the family and he'd sponsored several chess tournaments. And he offered to sponsor Laszlo and Clara 
to adopt three children from Africa and to train them using the same methods they'd used with their own children to try to repeat the experiment, if you will. Now, Clara had reservations and she talked Laszlo out of doing this. This was in the mid 90s. She talked him out of doing this because she realized that, you know, a lot of this work would fall to her and um, she wasn't the spring chicken that she once was. And maybe it's a little different to work with uh, adoptive children. I don't, I don't really know um, if that was part of it, but she did. They, they did turn down that opportunity and, and so that didn't happen. But it, um, for my sources, now I'll tell you, I used Judith Pogar's three books that she wrote, which talk about, it's a three volume series and it starts with How I Beat Fisher's Record, which takes us through 1991, and then from GM to Top 10, which takes us to about 2001, 2002. And then A Game of Queens, which takes us through her retirement. And I bought these thinking that they were going to be books about her biography, primarily. They are not. I thought they'd be organized chronologically. Loosely they are, but they're somewhat um, thematic. She instead talks about her chess thinking, and there's a lot of instruction in these books. Now, that's fascinating. It's not so useful for me. I would have really loved her thoughts on you know, being a woman in the good old boys club and all that, but unfortunately those details are few and far between. Instead, what we have is her chess thinking and a bunch of annotated games, and that's valuable in many ways, shapes, and forms, but in hindsight, I probably should have uh, looked around a little better to find some other more, perhaps, uh, comprehensive books. Instead, I found some very good articles that have been written, and the two that I have, well, I, I used her website, obviously, but the two that I list at the very top of my work cited are perhaps really interested. If you're, in, if you're interested in doing some further reading, I would highly recommend them. One is a work that appeared in Psychology Today, which talks a lot about the kind of the nature versus nurture, neuroanatomy, you know, how, you know, to encourage and inculcate creative thinking, and a little bit more about this 10,000 hour idea that I've mentioned with Gladwell's book. And then the second one is, the second source that I have listed is Frederick Friedel, his article that appeared the day she retired, and it's funny, he said, um, Judith Pogar's retirement caught, caught us out of the blue, and yet he posts a very comprehensive article that same day. So I think he had some insider information there, I really do, because his article is extremely con um, comprehensive, and Friedel talks about, he's been a friend of the family since the early 80s. You know, the more I do lectures on these contemporary chess players, Kasparov being another prime example, the more I think that we should credit um, Friedel with how much he's given to the world of chess over the past, well, almost 30 years, I suppose. And so in, in his work with computer chess and chess base and Kasparov and the Polgar family, he's been a family friend and has really put a lot of people in touch. And so um, he has some very personal re remembrances of the Polgar family and has some great photos. So I'd highly recommend uh, his um, write-up, which is posted on Chessbase's website. So anyway, those are the sources I have. You're more than welcome to consult them. I'll be glad to field any questions you might have. Uh, I have yeah. one. Sure. Uh, one thing you haven't really touched on is what I would call the ethics of what her parents did. Uh, I mean, to me, it's one thing like the Williams sisters' mm -hmm. uh, father to aggressively support the kids uh, during their career, but it's quite another to breed them ahead of time for a specific experimental purpose, as if they have no will of their own and are uh, uh, almost at the level of, of laboratory animals. I mean, is there any, did she touch on this in any of the books or, or things that you read? And I. I mean, there must be some uh, people other than me who wondered about this. Yeah, I've not seen Sophia's thoughts on this, but Susan is, and Judith are both very outspoken to say that, um, that they enjoyed the experience. Now, I think we can't overlook the amount of time that both parents spent with the children. I think in modern parenting, particularly when both parents work, 
you know, we have this tendency to send the kids to school and spend a little bit of time with them at home and maybe talk around the dinner table, but, you know, there's not much, there, there's perhaps not that close relationship. But the Pogars were the opposite extreme. They spent almost all their waking hours together. They were a very, very cohesive family for a number of years. And yes, the father was a little overbearing, I would say. He talks, for example, he says, you know, um, Judith is a little pudgy. And I'm very, it's because she loves junk food. And I don't, you know, I'm very strict with her diet, but her mom and grandmother really indulge her. Did we see the same photos of the dad? Yeah, he's pretty pudgy, which I thought, yeah, I, I noticed that as well. I keyed on that as well. And, and so in some aspects, their, their lives were very controlled. And the father said, you know, no, you're not going to go out and play, you know, for physical activity, you're going to play table tennis. And, and that's going to be your, your activity. And in some ways, we think that that's a great hindrance. But at the same time, they were almost indoctrinated to love chess. I mean, Susan showed a natural penchant for playing chess, and the father just encouraged that. And he, you know, trained her, brought in other trainers. I didn't mention that. Brought in people like Pal Benko to work with the girls and Fisher, obviously. And Judith and um, Sophia, I touched on this. They were basically excluded, but they wanted to be part of it. Now, part of that's wanting your parents' attention. You know, wanting to feel special and have that positive reinforcement. And I really am not in a place to make an ethical judgment about it. And in a sense, from a scientific perspective, I admire the fact that he had a theory and he set up a condition to prove his theories. And it's like Clara said, everything he promised has come, has come true. And the girls seem happy. So in that sense, you know, scientifically it, it brought, um, it contributed a lot to our understanding of development and the family seems happy and so in a sense I, I find it hard to judge it from that perspective but it is I'll grant you it's very weird and I didn't read any of the letters that that um, were exchanged between the parents prior to their marriage but it's it's very weird to think that their courtship was more um, a, you know just planning it was curriculum planning. It was not letters of love. It was, you know, soci it was psychological theories, I, I suppose. So I grant you that's weird, and I grant you the conditions are very weird. But the results, I, I guess, am I trying to say the ends justify the means? In a sense, I guess I am. Yeah. There's no simple answer to the question. No, I think that's an individual judgment. And, and I don't know that my judgment really matters. I think that... I think it's the girls, the, the women, I should say, themselves, who, who should speak to this. And if, and if they're happy with the result, and if Susan actually wanted to emulate to a certain extent the experience that she received, you know, I, I have to kind of uh, trust her judgment on that. I mean, these are, these are very bright women, and they're able to be objective about their own experience and make well-informed judgments about it, so I, I kind of am going to defer to them, I suppose. Okay. Would I do, would I consider, has this been my approach in parenting? No. <laughs> no, it is not. But, you know, I do agree with this 10,000 hour thing, and, and if a kid is really passionate about something, then I'm all about encouraging that. But it reminds me somewhat of the scandal a couple of years ago with the the op-ed piece, I believe, is in the New York Times called The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Does anybody remember that? About the Asian mom who would force her kids to sit at the piano and practice for hours and hours and hours on end and would apply a lot of academic pressure. And there are cultures that, are, that apply far more pressure than we do. South Korea, for example, where the high school students go to school from essentially 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., you know, Monday through Friday, and their life revolves around getting into a good university. I mean, Again, I can look at it as a very different ideology, but I can't really critique it without understanding it fully. Yeah, and uh, give my views there. I, I think it is uh, unusual. It's definitely not something you normally see with such a, a kind of cold approach to parenting, I guess. But you know, when you have kids, you, you have to make choices throughout their lives that will have huge effects on them that they have no control over. You know, you, you're young, you have to pick what food you eat. You have to pick what school they go to. You 
And sometimes they'll pick, you know, extracurricular activities or, you know, trips they'll go on, traveling, I mean, make so many decisions that they really have no control over. So, yeah, but, uh, but only to a certain point. And I yeah. mean, they're, they're individuals too with a, uh, yeah. uh, a will and a, an interest of their own. You know, yeah. that and the risk is that you would wipe that out entirely. And brainwashing is the word that comes to mind. Well, you know, the girls so, talk. They, although they don't, the, the, the girls don't agree, but yeah. you might even argue that that is a, a consequence of what right. has been done. Yeah, you could say it's know. almost like Stockholm Syndrome, kind of where you empathize with your captors' viewpoints. But I, um, I, I, you know, there is evidence, Judith and Susan, they talk about, you know, watching TV when they were kids. They talk about going on family vacations. They talk about, um, your Frederick Friedel talks when they came to visit him in, I think, 88 or 89, how they would spend their time in a hammock in the garden reading um, Hungarian teen magazines. And, you know, they were free to date. They were free to, um, you know, marry, I suppose. And, and, and so in, in many ways, I think they had, they had earned kind of that. They had, they had shown the maturity and the drive to manage all that themselves. And the, and the parents seemed to, to truly trust and respect. I mean, I think, I, I, if nothing else, I think uh, Laszlo Polgar is to be commended for his views on equality of the genders. This idea, this notion, espoused in the 60s and early 70s, that women were every bit as capable as men, that's pretty groundbreaking. And, and then to back it up and to devote his life to to proving that, I, and, and, and just just for that alone, I, I have to give him credit. You know, so that's, that was a very brave stand to take. No, visionary. Other questions? Okay, so check the calendar for next month. Next month will be Paul Morphy. If you don't know, he's a product of New Orleans, not too far down I-10, although it wasn't I-10 at the time, and pretty interesting. <laughs> um, this is the mid-19th eight, mid century, so the mid-1800s, and this is kind of the antebellum South that we're going to be looking at, and we're going to be looking at um, someone that Bobby Fischer said was quite inspirational, perhaps the best American chess player of all time, and someone who many people portray as a childhood prodigy, and, and he um, kind of had an issue with madness, kind of uh, maybe even probably actually a lot worse than, than Fischer, and so it'll be interesting to look at that as well. So that'll be um, next month, and, and Warren actually gets the very difficult task of of showing 150-year-old chess games when theory was quite different. And, and, and if now he, he looks at it and he says, well, this was the 1990s. Modern chess really likes to do this. Watch the, the mental uh, hoops he has to jump through to discuss the 1850s and 60s. That'll be fun.